please join me in a call to worship? In wilderness and wild places, in groans and breath and lonely spaces, in birth and rebirth, in fire and flame, in pain and joy beyond familiar traces, encounter the holy. We gather in this place, separated from our usual spaces, to wonder, laugh, and maybe even cry, to discover and to hope, to meet God here among us. Please join me in the unison prayer. There we venture, O oh God, into the wild places, wilderness spaces, frozen tundra, wind-swept outback, tangled bush, jagged mountain ranges, fathomless seas, so much beauty, so much danger, so much uncertainty. There we find you, God, present in painful stress, disappointed hopes, and almost abandon of dreams in the deep and anguished sighs and groans. Yes, God, you are here. Amen. Let us remind ourselves what we believe from the affirmation of faith in the back of the hymnal. You, O oh God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches anything we do. You have always been with us. You are God. You, O oh God, are infinitely generous, good beyond all measure. You came to us before we came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You, O oh God, are Holy Spirit. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You reconcile and heal. You overcome death. You are our God. We worship you. Please be seated. Thank you. 
It's always fun to have children come and be baptized today. And Jeremy and Kara Collins are going to bring their child, Jackson, to be baptized. They were bringing children to Jesus that Jesus might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, Jesus was indignant and he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them for to such belongs the realm of God. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the realm of God like a child shall not enter it. And so Jesus took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Jesus said, unless we are born in you, we cannot see the reign of God. Unless we are born of water and the spirit we cannot enter God's new order. And Paul the Apostle said, All of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into Christ's death. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of God, we too might walk in the newness of life. The sacrament of baptism, my friends, is an outward and a visible sign of the grace of God. And inasmuch as the promise of God is also not only to us, but also to our children. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church and the sign and seal of their participation in God's forgiveness and the beginning of their growth in the full Christian faith and discipleship. In this water, we've added three drops of water from the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. And so this is the water of baptism. And out of this water, we rise with new life forgiven of sin, and one in Christ, members of Christ's body. Now, Jeremy and Kara, I ask you some questions. Do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and the family of Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. Will you encourage this child to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, say we will with the help of God. Will you teach this child that he may be led to profess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior? If so, say, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. And do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and the word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, say, we do with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow with this child in the Christian faith, to help this child to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that he may affirm his baptism? If so, say we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. Jesus calls us to make disciples of all nations and to offer them the gift of grace and baptism do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love, support, and care to the one about to be baptized as he lives and grows in Christ? If so, say, we promise our love, support, and care. Promise our love, support, and care. Then let us unite with the church in all times and all places and take this as an opportunity to reaffirm our faith and confess our faith in the triune God. Do you believe in God? If so, say, I believe in God. I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Please pray with me. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation called forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters and out of the waters of the deep. You formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with the waters of the flood, and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. In the time of Moses, your people, Israel, passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom, and they crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the Promised Land. So in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. And Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan and became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of the disciples and sent them forth to baptize all the nations by water and the Holy Spirit. Blessed by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. By your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create new life in the one baptized today, that he may find joy in the service of Jesus, his Savior. 
We give glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and shall always be, world without end. Amen. Come visit me. Okay. You're getting to be a big boy, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. By what name do you call this child? Jackson. Say this whole name. Jackson Lee Collins. Jackson Lee Collins, I baptize you in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, I'll be right back. Oh, gracious God, we bring before you one of our children, and we know, God, that it's through your grace that each of our children are given to us, and the great responsibility that comes with raising them is beyond measure. We ask God that you'd bless him and his parents as they grow together in faith. Help him to grow and know that you, God, created him and that your son Jesus died for him. Watch over him. May he be a man of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. You know, Jackson, I know you have to tolerate this. There he is, folks. Yeah. Oh, grandmas and grandpas and everybody over there, we got to smile for him. Come on down and join me. Here's a rose for you to take home. And here's a box with Jackson's cradle cross in it. Oh, yeah. That's okay. This robe has seen a lot of, has seen a lot of stuff go on over the years. There's a cradle cross in there for you to put on the wall for him to see when he wakes up in the morning. I'll return him to you. Can we get him there? Okay, and then they have a gift for you too to take home. I'll give you one more thing. There you go. Go now and raise your son in peace. God bless you. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 to 15. There is the desert, they all complain. There in the desert, they all complained to Moses and Aaron and said to them, We wish that the Lord had killed us in Egypt. There we could at least sit down and eat meat and as much other food as we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve us all to death. The Lord said to Moses, Now I am going to cause food to rain down from the sky for all of you. The people must go out every day and gather enough for that day. In this way I can test them to find out if they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to bring in twice as much as usual and prepare it. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, this evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the dazzling light of the Lord's presence. He has heard your complaints against him, yes, against him, because we are only carrying out his instructions. Then Moses said, it is the Lord who will give you meat to eat in the evening and as much bread as you want on the morning, because he has heard how much you have complained against him. When you complain against us, you are really complaining against the Lord. Moses said to Aaron, tell the whole community to come and stand before the Lord, because he has heard your complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole community, they turned toward the desert, and suddenly the dazzling light of the Lord appeared in a cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight they will have meat to eat, and in the morning they will have all the bread they want. Then they will know that I, the Lord, am their God. In the evening a large flock of quails flew in, enough to cover the camp. And in the morning there was dew all around the camp. When the dew evaporated, there was something thin and flaky on the surface of the desert. It was as delicate as frost. 
When the Israelites saw it, they didn't know what it was and asked each other, what is it? Moses said to them, that is the food that the Lord has given you to eat. Our Old Testament reading is from Paul's letters uh, for the Philippians. Um, and it is uh, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. For what is life? To me, it is Christ. Death, then, will bring more. But if by continuing to live, I can do more worthwhile work, then I am not sure which I should choose. I am pulled in two directions. I want very much to leave this life and be with Christ, which is a far better thing. But for your sake, it is much more important that I remain alive. I am sure of this, and so I know that I will stay. I will stay on with you all to add to your progress and joy in the faith, so that when I am with you again, you will have even more reason to be proud of me in your life and union with Christ Jesus. Now the important thing is, that your way of life should be as the gospel of Christ requires, so that whether or not I am able to go on and see you, I will hear that you are standing firm with one common purpose, and that with only one desire you are fighting together for the faith of the gospel. Don't be afraid of your enemies. Always be courageous, and this will prove to them that we will, they will lose and that you will win, because it is, it is, it is God who gives you the victory. For you have been given the privilege of serving Christ, not only by believing in him, but also by suffering for him. Now you can take part with me in the battle. It is the same battle you saw me fighting in the past, and as you hear, the one I am fighting still. Today's Bible verse is from Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not discourage, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. is taken this morning, uh, the gospel lesson is taken this morning from Matthew chapter 20, beginning the first verse. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus is speaking and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. He went out again to the marketplace at nine o'clock and saw some men standing there doing nothing. And so he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard, and I will pay you a fair wage. And so they went. Then at 12 o'clock, and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. It was nearly 5 o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing, he asked them. Well, no one hired us, they answered. Well, then, you go and work in the vineyard, he told them. So when evening came, the owner told his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. And so when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more, but they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun, yet you paid them the same as you paid us. 
Listen, friend, the owner answered one of them. I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who was hired last as much as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I'm generous? And Jesus concluded, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. And those are the blessed words of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Glory be to And the peace of God be with you. Please welcome one another. Go ahead. Good morning. One more time, because you guys are really good. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I knew that. I knew that. Yeah. Have any of you ever complained? Yeah, they're laughing out there. Any of you ever complained? Who's ever complained? Ah, yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, mom's looking at you. <laughs> yeah. What kind of things have you complained about? 
Yeah. Doing your homework. Oh, I don't want to do my homework. Oh, mom, dad, don't make me do my homework. What? Not getting enough food at supper. <laughs> oh, they're trying hard, pal, but you just keep eating and eating and eating. Yeah. When you make stuff you don't like and you, don't, you have to do it, but you do. Well, what? Taking a shower? <laughs> Okay, anything else? Oh, we complain about all kinds of stuff, don't we? You know, I get up on a, on a winter morning, and winter time is coming, and I get up on a winter morning, and I look out there, and I, oh, man, I got to shovel the snow. Oh. Yay, huh, for you. Yeah, maybe a day off school, right? I got it. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, adults complain all the time, too. We grab, oh, I went to the grocery today. Can you believe how much food costs? And I got to feed that boy. Oh, yeah. We complain all the time, don't we? We gripe and we growl and all that kind of stuff. Do you know how much people complain to God? God, why did you let this happen to me? Where were you when I needed you, God? Oh, God, you can't let this happen. You know, people complain all the time. The Israelites, in the story we read from the Bible today, the Old Testament story, the Israelites were complaining to God. You know, they'd been slaves. They'd been beat up in Egypt and all that kind of stuff. And here they are out in the wilderness, and they're saying to Moses, Moses, you brought us out here to die. You'd have been right with them. I'm starving. <laughs> we're going to go. We're going to die from hunger out here. But what they didn't realize was God was going to take care of them. You know, we have a lot of things we can complain about in life. I know some people that complain about nothing, and I've run into people who do nothing but complain. Yeah. But complaining never really gets anything done. No, never changes anything. Maybe some things, you know, you might realize that there is something. You know, there are some things sometimes you do have a right to complain about, and maybe good things can come of that, you know. But for the most part, complaining and living a life where you just do nothing but complain doesn't get anything done. What we have to realize is that in spite of what happens to us that we could complain about, God will take care of us. Yeah, that's what our hymn earlier said. God will take care of you in every, every day or all the way. God will take care of you. That's right. Some things seem to go wrong. You know, life is not perfect, you know. None of you are perfect. Is there any one of you that's perfect? Oh, of course. How did I know? <laughs> yeah. But not really. We have things that go wrong in our lives, things that aren't perfect, and things we could complain about. But when we talk to God and we say to God, this is what's happening to me, I really wish you would help me. God hears that prayer. The Israelites complained because they were starving to death. And you know what God did? God gave them food. And they didn't have to starve anymore. God took care of them. God will take care of you. That's important to remember. Whatever you feel is going wrong in your life, whatever seems upsetting, think about it. Talk to God about it. And God will take care of you. Okay? Will you pray with me? God, we are so grateful that you will take care of us. We know, God, that there are many things we could complain about in this world, many struggles that are going on, many difficulties and stuff, but help us to learn to lay it all before you and help us to see through you the way we can overcome the things that are what we complain about. Bless our children. They are such good people and they make our church strong and we're so happy that they're here and so much a part of our church. Bless each one of them, and may they continue to grow in their faith and be closer to you as they serve you in this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Amen. Thanks for coming up.
kind of a jazzy number. I kind of like that. I hope what I have to share with you today will strengthen you in your faith and help you go the next mile that you have to travel in life and will we'll make a difference for you, I hope. Present anxiety can distort the truth of even recent past. Present anxiety can distort the truth of even recent past. When we find ourselves in a moment of despair, feeling a sense of being bereft, a sense of being deprived, of being desolate, is truly when any of us could really lose clear vision and lose clear understanding of what really is going on around us. That's what happened to the Hebrews, former Egyptian slaves, when they found themselves roaming in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses, former prince of Egypt. Discouraged, hungry, and just downright grumpy. They came to Moses and they complained. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and we ate our fill of bread. For you, Moses, you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Their bellies were crying out as their memory forgot the 430 years of oppression, the 430 years of whips, of hard labor, of cruel beatings, of women and children scourged, and of old people being murdered. Their bellies became more important than that memory. The Hebrews' bellies had caused them to forget the awful things that had happened to them and only remember that at least while they were in Egypt, at least we had food. The cost of freedom, which never was free, was taking its toll on the children of Israel, the former slaves of Egypt. When you are hungry for something you don't or you cannot have, it can cause you to have an inordinate sense of being deprived. You actually become mournful. You actually become bereaved. It can blind one to the truth of his or her own life. For instance, the easiest thing to point to, there is no greater loss than when someone you truly love dies. Most people grieve, most people shed tears, and most people learn to cope. And then they continue to go on living their lives, always missing that one whom he or she lost, but recognizing that life is still good and life must still be lived. There are those people, however, who get caught in the trap of suffering what is called morbid grief. That is an actual terminology, morbid grief. Over my four decades of ministry, I have encountered a few who suffered this, men this mentally painful malady. In every case, they had wonderful people all around them. They had children, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, spouses. In every case, however, they were all not capable of letting go of the losses of family and friends which they had suffered. And believe me, these people truly suffer. But their present anxiety that they have distorts the truth of their past and blinds them to the blessedness of their present and the possibility that exists for their future. Sadly, they cannot move on. And they live life on hold. And you know what happens to those people who suffer morbid grief that I've noticed? What happens then is friends no longer come around because nobody wants to be close to them anymore. Family just learns to cope with them. And they retreat into a shell of isolation, awaiting their own physical deaths, while at the same time killing their own souls. And they just keep retreating and retreating and retreating. The Hebrews were living in the desert wilderness, away from the comforts of life that they had had, even though they were slaves. 
albeit a life that was oppressive and a life that was harsh as the slaves of Egypt. They mourned what they had begun to perceive as being what they had lost rather than what they, in truth, had escaped. What they had lost was more important to them than what they had gotten away from. Slavery to the Egyptians. Now, we all, in a sense, are on a journey in the desert that we call life. Daily, we are confronted with how we will make this journey. Often, the sense of being deprived while on that journey makes us think there was a time long ago when we had things that were better, you know. We always talk about this. Oh, yeah, back when I was a kid, things were a whole lot better. Yeah. You know, we didn't have to deal with this stuff that we deal with today. Oh, how often those of us who are older remember in our mind's eye what seems a better day when our parents protected us, when our parents fed us, when our parents took care of our problems and we were carefree. And how many times do you want to go back and be a six-year-old because you can't stand what's going on around you? Oh, my, would you really? In reality, none of us were really that carefree, however. All of our families had some sort of struggles. Maybe their struggles were economic and we watched mom and dad struggle through it. Maybe mom was always depressed. Maybe dad drank a little too much. Maybe the bills didn't get paid. And the list goes on. They really weren't that good of days. But we shove away the things like that. Time passes, memory fades, the pain is forgotten, and the present seems so different. And so we call out to God, and we complain, and we ask the big question, Why? Why, God? Where are you, God? Why aren't you doing what I want? And the question should be, why not? Why should this not happen to me? I was the one that got myself in this situation anyway. Why should I not be experiencing this pain? I'm the one that caused it. Why should I think death should not come my way when it comes the way of everybody else too? Why should I be any different? Why not? Life has its twists and its turns. And because it does, we find a few things we have to engage in combat spiritually in our desert journey called life. We engage these things spiritually. One of those things is the feeling of despair. When you are confronted with despair, it is a feeling of having lost hope. You have no more hope. The sense of, 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 of want of what you should have is you just want to give up of what should happen. It's not going to happen. There's not one person in the face of this planet that has not encountered despair in her or his life. Not one. Even the happiest of people. Despair robs you of your power. It causes you to believe that there is nothing you can do about whatever discouraging situation you face. And how many days, how many times every day do we each one give away our power? We give away our power to people who bother us. We let them bother us. We don't have to be bothered by them. It's their problem, their, their struggle. But, we let, but they bother us because they're irregular people and they're toxic and we let what they do and what they say upset us. And we give them our power, allowing them to upset us. Just as an example, another of those things that we have to combat spiritually is the sense of need, meaning having the lack of something that is deemed necessary to make life work. Uh, perhaps one feels the need for material things that others around have. I don't have what he has. Why don't I have what he has? Shouldn't I have what he has? My 
life can't be complete because I don't have what he has. Woe is me. Perhaps the need is more about being loved or having other people who care about you and not feeling like you're cared for. Maybe the need cannot even be verbalized because she or he hasn't been able to put a finger on just what it is that seems to be missing in life. But we have to combat that sense of need. A third thing we often have to spiritually combat is anxiety, which is fear, and usually of the unknown. 99.9% my psychiatrist friends will tell you I have a friend who's a psychiatrist. One time I said, said 95%, and he corrected me after I said, he said, no, no, 99.9%. 99.9% of the unknown of what you worry about will not happen. We grow comfortable with what we know, even if what we know is causing us harm, as was the enslavement that the Hebrews were in. It was all that they had known for 430 years. And that's the reason some people remain in abusive relationships. Or they stay in jobs that are killing them. Or they stay hooked on drugs. Or believe they've got to have that next drink. I had a dentist friend who died at the age of 72. He had diabetes, lost a leg, well-educated man, very wealthy from his practice. Jim just didn't get it. And to visit him, one morning we got up, and he said, Ed, come along with me. But first he went over to his bar, and he put some ice in there, and he poured himself some scotch. That's in the morning. We got in the car, he put the scotch in the cup holder. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God. And you know where Jim and I went? We went to the liquor store where he bought another Magnum, put it in the car and drove home. Killing him, and it killed him. He died at the age of 72. Lost his left leg because his diabetes got so bad because he couldn't stop drinking. Ran his wife to death taking care of him. She died at the age of 69. Didn't take care of herself, taking care of him. real things that happen. Those folks live in a constant state of anxiety. People who let other things control their lives. People to whom, who give away their power to other things, to other people, to other situations. They live in a constant state of anxiety whether they believe it or not. And if they don't believe it, they live in denial. And the rest of us can see it. Comfortable with what they know, wanting a change, but afraid of the unknown, and so they suffer. Young ones, hear what I'm saying. This is a 64-year-old man talking to you. I know what I am saying. Listen to me now before you're 64 and you can't back up. You can't change it. Listen to me now. But there is an answer to all of this, you know. The Hebrews' complaints were heard by God, and God made a way for them to have meat to eat with quail landing. And the quail came, had to have come from, from the areas of the sea, and they had to fly inland where they were, fly into the desert. Quail don't go there. God sent them there. The wind patterns moved them to where they were, and the quail were tired, and the quail landed on the ground, and there they were for the taking, too tired to fly anymore. And so the Hebrew people had meat to eat. And the next morning, there was bread on the ground with the dew. The lesson the Hebrews learned in their desert journey is that somehow you just have to figure out how to live in the desert. Because that's where you are. 
You just have to somehow figure out how you're going to live right where you are in your life. And that is the way to do it. That is to depend on God to see you through. Author David Rensberger makes an interesting statement pointing out in his article called Deserted Places. You know, deserted has that word desert in it, D-E-S-E-R-T, deserted. Deserted places. He points out that, he says, the divine presence is not the way out of the desert. What? God is not the way out of the desert? Rensberger goes on to say, the divine presence is the way through the desert. Not the way out. God isn't your way out. God isn't your escape. God isn't going to be the one who's going to pull you out of this and say, okay, you're going to be okay. God is the one who's going to get you through it. Through it. Whatever it is. God Yahweh, God's holy name Yahweh, is the key. In this story, in this story of the Hebrews walk toward freedom and away from enslavement into a desert appearing bereft of any life-giving presence, it was that wilderness that was, in the end, inhabited by God. It wasn't while they were in slavery. That wasn't where they found God. That is not where they found God. They found God in the wilderness of their life. That's where, it was, that's where God was. In the wilderness places, in the deserted places, is where they found God. It is, my friend, in the spiritual wilderness in which we may find ourselves and find our God at times where we most confront despair, where we most confront a sense of need, where we most confront a sense of anxiety, fear of that unknown, and it is there. It is in that place. Not in our abundance. Not in all the toys. Not in all the homes. Not in all the cars you could have. Not in the booze, not in the drugs, not in all that stuff. It is in those places where you will find God. Recently, in a sermon, a couple sermons back, I quoted Ernest Hemingway to you, and I want to quote him again or paraphrase him again. He said, the world breaks us all in some way, and it is often at those broken places where we become the strongest. It's in the wilderness of our lives where we truly will find God. Israel's complaint and their brokenness was dealt with by, the massive dis by a massive disclosure that in the wilderness, in the lifeless, deserted places of our lives, God is promptly and always decisively present. When things get going bad, when the crisis comes, that's where God is. That's when you really need God. Not to be your genie in a magic lamp to give you what you want. Oh, Lord, help me win the lottery today. Oh, God, this football game means it all. Help us win the football game. Oh, God, I really like that new car. I don't need a new car, but I really, really, really like that car. I want one. That's my problem. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? God meets you in the wilderness. And it is in the wilderness that God will take care of you in every way through all the day. God will take care of you like God took care of the Israelites, like God took care of all of God's people throughout all of history, in the crisis, in the wilderness, in the struggle, in the midst of the fight, in the greatest of despair. One of the illustrations I just remembered that I like most about this kind of thing is one that was written by Elie Wiesel, who had been in a German concentration camp. And it was about, and I've used it here before, but just now I think of it because it makes sense. 
It was about how there was a 15-year-old boy who had stolen a loaf of bread in this German concentration camp, Nazi concentration camp. And to set him as an example, they brought the whole camp together, gathered everybody around, all the prisoners. And they put a noose around this 15-year-old boy's neck, and they said to all of them, this is what will happen to you if anyone else steals another loaf of bread. And they clipped the gallows and hung him. And for 15 minutes, his body dangled there. He was still alive. For 15 minutes, he hung there on the rope, dying. And a woman in the crowd hollers up, Where is God? Where is God? And Elie Weissel, who was present at that hanging, said, I thought to myself, There is God hanging on the gallows. For that is where God meets us in our greatest despair, in our lowest moment, in the wilderness places of our lives. God will meet us there and take care of us. You can count on it. Amen. Will you pray with me? Oh God, some of the problems that we face in our lives, we, we think of them as being all important. And really, they're very little problems when you compare under the whole spectrum of things that go on in the world. And sometimes we are so selfish. We think only of ourselves. And sometimes we do recognize, though, that in our deepest moments of despair, for some reason, when nobody else seems to be there, when nobody else seems to care, you care. You care because you love us. And so we should love you. Forgive us, God, for our waywardness. Forgive us of the sins that we have committed and for the sin of not doing what we should have done, our sins of omission. Forgive us for turning our backs on you. Forgive us for not worshiping you like we should. Forgive us for not being there for you when you're always there for us. Help us each one through this malaise that we have in our lives that allows us to stand back and say, God, be the way I want you to be instead of God, mold me in the way I should be. As we pray today, God, we remember that unfortunately not all of our number were able to be in church today because some of them are ill and some of them are, are in a state of panic in their lives and trouble in their lives. And we think particularly of the ones that we mentioned before church this morning. And we remember, God, that there are those that are watching, there are those watching us on television who can't get here. That's why we have this TV ministry, just to get it into their homes and to touch their lives. And we're thankful for the ability to do that. But we remember them too, and we pray for them. We pray, God, that you'd be near these people who we know is sick, as being sick and having problems in their lives right now and difficulties. Watch over them. Watch over this church. You help us to be an abundant place. We have much, and so we have much to give. And we do, because you have given us the opportunities that lay before us. We thank you that Thursday night we sent out 493 meals most of which went to people who could have never paid for them, or if they paid for them, they would have been lacking for the rest of the week and not had the money they needed to pay other bills. We thank you that we're able to do things in the community that touch the lives of others and work through places like Agape and give what we have to give. We thank you for the privilege of doing those things. We thank you, God, that you have honored us with the opportunity to serve you. So bless this church. Please continue to bless us. And bless this nation, bless this world with a sense of peace and honor. There's too much evil roaming the streets now, even in our own country. There's too much evil happening in the Middle East. Evil is having its word. And we hope, God, that maybe it's evil is just trying the best it can to get its last word 
And that's why it's disrupting the world. We pray, God, that you'll continue to remind what is evil, that it does not have the victory. That just like you went before the people of Israel in the wilderness and you defeated their enemies for them, just like you went before the people of Israel in the wilderness and you provided the food and whatever it was that they needed, that you too, God, for us, will provide what we need and what the world needs, and that is love and peace and hope again. We pray for that earnestly, and we pray this prayer in the name of the one who died for our sins, Jesus, your Son, the Son of the living God, and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You have the unique opportunity to let what you have earned, to let what you know, to let what your talents you have, to let what time you have to give, honor the creator of all the universe. And so when you give today, you're not just giving to a budget. You're giving to the work of the one who made you, the one who gave you life, the one who is real, the most real part of all of the universe the creator, God Almighty. Give what you can and God will bless you.
Thank you for the ability to give what we have to give in time and talent and treasures. May we glorify you with all of these things that we have to give. May we lift up your name before all people. And may we say that indeed God is a good God. God is the one who we follow. God is the one in whom we believe. Bless now these gifts in the hands that prepared them and receive them for your service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Just a reminder that right after the church service today, there is a congregational meeting. I want to invite all of those, those of you who are in the back to come forward for the meeting so it's easier to, that's the president's of the church's desire that you'd come forward and make it uh, so we're closer together and we can talk. When you go from this place though, I want you to remember to whom it is that you belong. You belong to God and that will never change. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you run toward or away from the Creator, you will always belong to God. And so God will always love you. And when you go out into the world, live that love in your faith, in your practice, in your words, and in your deeds. And by doing that, God will see what you've done, and God will bless you. God's face will shine on you, and God will grant you eternal peace. Amen.